This is Optimal Finance Daily, Episode 28, How I Became Financially Independent in Five Years, Part 1, by Jacob Lund Fisker of EarlyRetirementExtreme.com. Get ready to maximize your potential with Optimal Finance Daily, the podcast that brings you the best content in personal finance five days a week. Your optimal life awaits. Now here's your host, Dan Warren. Hi again, everyone, and welcome back to Optimal Finance Daily. Does anybody remember that Greyhound bus ad campaign, Leave the Driving to Us? Well, here at Optimal Finance Daily, you can leave the reading to us because instead of having to go and search out the best personal finance bloggers on the planet, we bring their words to you here in audio form five days a week. If you have any topic requests for us, come visit oldpodcast.com. And I'm doing something a little bit different, a little bit special this week, and I'm reading three posts in a row from Jacob over at Early Retirement Extreme. He has a fascinating story about how he was able to retire at age 33, and that story is four parts long, so I'm going to be reading you most of the story, parts one, two, and three, uh, today, tomorrow, and Friday to close out the week. So with that, let's jump right into it and start optimizing your life. How I Became Financially Independent in Five Years, Part 1, by Jacob Lund Fisker of EarlyRetirementExtreme.com. I posit that most people can attain financial independence in less than 10 years and in less than five if they're truly determined. I also submit that many people are not willing to make the necessary changes. My journey towards financial independence was not always with financial independence in mind per se. Had that been my sole goal all along, I would have done things differently and probably faster, for instance, three to four years instead of five. If I had a six-figure income, which I never had, I would be able to do it in two or three years. However, that's the thing. As we gain in knowledge and wisdom, our priorities change, as that which was once important becomes less important, as things are put in a different and hopefully bigger perspective. First of all, I have to confess that I have never been dumb with money. I believe I once made an accidental overdraft because I forgot about an automatic payment, but otherwise, I have never been in the red zone. I also suspect I was born with certain miserly qualities so that I did not need to change my basic personality too much. Spending money on spontaneous fun like perishables, candy, ice cream, parties, beer, going out have never meant much to me. Instead, I was more interested in gadgets and electronics. Basically, I would discover some new hobby, then I would save until I had the money, and then I would go out and buy a new computer, then an SLR camera, then a hi-fi rack, then another computer, then a telescope, etc. Since I enjoyed gadgets a lot more than sugar, alcohol, cab fares, and other things that seemed to make everybody else happy, I was already ready to save for big items, and thus it was not so hard for me to aim for something bigger. The first thing I realized was therefore that my expensive hobbies had to go and be replaced with free hobbies, which meant no more buying toys. Instead, I became interested in system administration, Linux, and geopolitics, in particular resource depletion and overpopulation, which of course makes for great icebreakers at any cocktail party. I did not immediately make the connection to think of hobbies that make me money. At the time when I started saving money to keep it rather than spend it on the next big piece of electronics, I was a grad student living in a dorm room. There were 18 other people on the floor and we all shared a kitchen, three showers, and three toilets. Most grad students I have known all had their own apartment, their own car, etc., and thus leave school with a degree and a ton of student debt. I did, however, not live there to save money, but to meet other people more easily. In addition, it was only a 10-minute walk or a five-minute run from my office and five minutes from the closest supermarket. Thus, I did not need a car nor a bike. The two personal finance books that have influenced and inspired me the most, and which I caught hold of at the time, were Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Your Money or Your Life. If I could have only two personal finance books, those would be it. Your Money or Your Life can easily be summarized. There are two main ideas. The first idea is to calculate your real wage by subtracting taxes, transport, business clothes, cost of living, For instance, suppose your job requires you to live in New York City. And dividing by time spent on the job, time spent on commuting, and time spent unofficially preparing yourself for the job. If you do this calculation, you might find some particularly scary numbers. For instance, the hourly real wage of a commuting grad student, for instance, a highly skilled and competent person who would fetch forty dollars to $60,000 in the private sector, is certainly below the minimum wage. The second idea is to use the real wage to calculate the cost of something in hours. 
Suppose a Wii is $400 and your real wage comes to around $8 an hour. Then you would have to work for 50 hours to get it. Since we only live once and never get this time back, those 50 hours have to be weighed against the game system. 50 hours seems fair to me, however, there was no way I was going to add 10 more hours on top of that by buying it on credit. In particular, I did not want to pay for my house three times over by getting a mortgage. Thus, my initial motivation was to save for a house to avoid the mortgage interest. Apparently, the personal finance blogging community doesn't like Rich Dad, Poor Dad because it does not contain enough quote-unquote actionable items and or because the author gave some questionable real estate advice in some of his subsequent seminars. For me, though, that book was like striking gold. It completely changed my attitude towards money from being something one spends to buy stuff to being something one invests to make more money. Leave it to me to figure out the details. I'm a smart guy, but it takes a genius to create a paradigm shift, and I am not a genius. By rich dad, poor dad standards, I was still thinking like a poor person, saving and paying in cash, and I was probably on my way to thinking like a middle-class person who buys everything on credit. Instead, I started thinking like a wealthy person and having my money work for me while cutting down on my liabilities and avoiding having me work for money. My guess is that it is probably easier to go from poor to wealthy than from middle class to wealthy. The middle class is weighed down by a large set of liabilities in the form of house payments, car payments, credit payments, educational payments. Once you have those liabilities, they're very hard to give up to replace with assets. Initially, I was just putting my money in savings accounts and watching it grow. In retrospect, pure savings accounts turned out to be a good idea since that was the period from 2001 to 2004, which was mostly a bear market. But an important point is that I did not invest for the first three years out of the five years it took me to gain financial independence. For extreme savers, financial independence is not achieved through investing. There is simply not enough time for compounding to make much of a difference. Instead, compounding becomes somewhat irrelevant as the eventual portfolio becomes more focused on preserving principal, generating income, and not suffering too much in terms of inflation and taxes. To be continued. You just listened to the post titled How I Became Financially Independent in Five Years, Part 1, by Jacob Lund Fisker of EarlyRetirementExtreme.com. And as a special thank you to Jacob for becoming the newest author to join Optimal Finance Daily and Optimal Living Daily, I'm going to read part two and part three of this entry to end this week. And then if you want to hear part four, you can visit his website, which again is earlyretirementextreme.com. And while you're out there on the web, come by oldpodcast.com to get your free money tracking spreadsheet and free video tutorial that goes along with it. Justin over at Optimal Living Daily built this spreadsheet just for you. And it's one of the many free gifts that you can get by joining our free weekly newsletter, over at oldpodcast.com. You can also join by texting the word financial to the number 44222. That's text the word financial to 44222. That is a great way to show your support for this podcast and to let us know that you want to hear more episodes. So again, text financial to 44222 or visit oldpodcast.com. And that's it for episode 28 of Optimal Finance Daily. I'll see you in tomorrow's show where we'll continue with Jacob's story. See you there where your optimal life awaits. Hello, Life Optimizer. This is Justin Mollick, creator and producer of this podcast, but also Optimal Living Daily, the show where I read to you from even more blogs covering finance, productivity, minimalism, personal development, and more from amazing bloggers like Derek Sivers, Zen Habits, The Minimalists, and all the ones you hear on this show too. So if you enjoyed today's episode and like taking amazing blogs on the go, Come on over to Optimal Living Daily and subscribe to that one too. And together, we'll start optimizing your life. You've been listening to Optimal Finance Daily. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on each new episode and head to oldpodcast.com. That's oldpodcast.com for a free gift as well as more actionable tips and resources to help you maximize your potential. Thanks for joining us. And remember, your optimal life awaits.